Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. This is the um, interviewing a physician scientist portion of our Emerging Therapeutics series um, with regards to sparsentin for IgA. I'm joined today by Dr. Chien Yang, uh, who is a third year nephrology fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Vinay Srinivasan. I'm assistant professor of medicine at Cooper University Healthcare at the Med School of Rowan University in New Jersey, and a Glomcon faculty member. And our guest today is Dr. Gaia Kopik. Dr. Kopik is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She did her medical school at the University of Texas, followed by internal medicine residency at the University of Virginia, and then nephrology fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kopik then did further subspecialization in both glomerular disease and transplant nephrology. And she also has a background in basic science. Uh, she's led many of the clinical trials with regards to both IgA and other glomerular diseases at the University of Pennsylvania. So we're very excited to have you today, Dr. Kopik. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to start off with um, a general overview and ask what is your opinion for endothelial uh, receptor antagonists for IgA nephropathy, specifically with regards to the current clinical evidence that we have? Um, so, you know, I think that it's very, it's always exciting to have new drugs in our field. Um, you know, we've got kind of two potential options in the endothelial and receptor antagonist world. One is pure endothelial receptor antagonists, which are currently being studied in clinical trials. And then the other one is the dual endothelial and angiotensin receptor antagonist, the DRA class, where it's in one molecule that has two functions, the ARB plus the endothelial and receptor antagonist together, uh, which we, has recently been approved that sparsentin. So, you know, I think that there are they're really promising. It's really wonderful to have a new tool in our in our arsenal that is an effective medication at lowering proteinuria and is kind of within the scope of medications that we already know how to prescribe or used in some other diseases. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Yang for the next question for you. Thank you, Dr. Kalbach, for meeting with us. Could you tell us the difference between uh, sparsentin, Athera, um, and other endothelial um, receptor antagonists? Sure. Um, so basically, sparsentin is um, a backbone, an ARB backbone that I think is most structurally similar to Erbisartan, which is why that's the control arm in their study, with cut like complex onto that and endothelial and receptor antagonist complex, I suppose. And so within the same molecule, it blocks two things, uh, two receptors, whereas um, an endothelial receptor antagon antagonist alone just has that one function. And so um, ultimately, if you would want to use it in combination with Rasblocate, it would be two different medications. So how that impacts on disease and whether it's meaningful that they're two different compounds, I don't think we know, but I think it's uh, certainly an interesting question and exciting to like, I guess, wait to see. Thank you, Dr. Papa. And how will you decide which patient um, you'll prescribe the ERAs um, versus budenoside versus refer the patient to all our clinical trials? Um, I So I, I don't, think that with IG nephropathy, there you can really make rules. That's sort of been my experience, is that it is really, really hard to decide which patients should get which therapy. Generally speaking, I do try to give a really good, um, uh, if you want a run-in period, which most clinical trials require anyway, with either, you know, RAS blockade or now potentially with these new newer therapies considering one of those immunosuppression in, in ig nephropathy is a difficult question um i think it's getting easier because we have options like budesonide that have fewer side effects which is always the biggest concern of trying it but i think that the data are really mixed and so knowing when it works and when it doesn't i don't ever feel confident about to be honest but I think that people who kind of may be more at risk of progression, whether it's because of their age of presentation, um, potentially like uh, people of South Asian descent, maybe a little bit more um, 
responsive or, uh, you know, systemic symptoms, certainly you might consider it. Those are just like very, very broad categories. Um, so I think really you have to kind of do an assessment of, of what you consider safe uh, and risk versus benefit about trying something like an immunosuppressive agent versus an endothelial receptor antagonist for DRA. And then I always think patients should get an option for a clinical trial. I still think we have ground to cover in IG nephropathy. I think we still have improvements to achieve. So even if they're on an agent that we have access to, certainly if they're not controlled, they should be in a clinical trial. I think um, I wanted to get your opinion on Dr. Kopic is that sparsentin requires a REMS program by both the uh, patient and the physician as well. And I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, any burdens on access to the medication from it. You know, the clinical trial, it's a little bit easier in terms of you have all the site monitoring, you have a um, you know, research coordinator, um, someone else to assist with that. But what about you know, patients in uh, who see a nephrologist in the private world uh, and you know, the burden to access this medication, both for hepatotoxicity monitoring, as well as um, in women of childbearing age for pregnancy? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, the pregnancy thing, if they like the monitoring piece is different, but you wouldn't have, a, I mean, you would have the same kind of like risk benefit um, factoring, I think, with breast blockade as you would with um, something like sparsentin. You know, in both cases, you would need to do some counseling and you wouldn't want somebody to become pregnant when they were on that. Um, you know, in terms of the, uh, I think access to care is a really big problem with any new drug and and a frustrating barrier for patients and providers that, you know, um, it requires a lot of extra work and sometimes that is a huge barrier. I, you know, I am spoiled at Penn because we have a lot of people to help us navigate that. And we, you know, because we've been a site for the clinical trials, we also, work closely with the, um, like the company has a lot of resources for physicians that, that are available to everyone, but we just have like, you know, those pathways already established. Um, so I, you know, I think that we just do the best we can with getting our patients access to care. And certainly we cannot ask them to do more than they, they can tolerate financially or otherwise. I am someone who likes frequent lab monitoring. So for me, monthly labs is like not that weird. Um, so my patients don't always want to do that. And so again, I think it's just, you know, it's how you view it. I think the REMS is uh, pretty strict, you know, when you looking at the actual data. But I also think that you know, for me personally, as a provider, I never mind more monitoring because it always makes me feel good to know that we're being safe. And that's just a conversation you have to have with your patients. Very true and very well put. Um, Dr. Kopic, thank you for taking the time to speak with Dr. Yang and myself. We really appreciate your expertise on IGA and Sparsentin. And it was a pleasure to, um, to speak with you today. Thanks, guys.